The video you just watched outlined a lot of features in the Star Engine. It's a reminder of what makes this game so special. It's a focus on fidelity, I said it. It's a focus on immersion, and it's a focus on seamlessness, being able to go everywhere, and you just, you're just there. The accomplishments from the tech teams at CIG have been numerous in building all the technology that allow you to run the game and allow you to experience the same things that we see in our dev setups. And so what we're about to see today is a deep dive into all these features. We have been developing Star Engine for many years with the goal of creating an online living universe. But creating a universe is not an easy task, and even more difficult to do everything seamless without any loading screens or invisible walls. And massive spaceships flying very fast, close to the terrain and objects, are pushing the limits of procedural generation and streaming. This is not a single-player game. So creating this universe online is making everything more challenging. We stream and generate physics on server, on CPU, and we already support more than 100 players on a single server, more with server meshing. To support all this, the engine must do a lot of work every frame. So in a typical Star Engine frame update, we got up to 64 hardware threads, about 200 software ones, over 700,000 streamed in entities, and millions of entities overall in the solar system, about 150,000 updates per frame. We have over 200 vehicles, spaceships, and ground ones, over 2 million physical objects, over 100,000 objects generated per frame when flying over the terrain. We have many unique locations streaming on demand in a seamless, gigantic space. Also, we are supporting many new features that we are going to showcase today. I'm going to start in introducing the new and improved clouds and fog worked on by Carsten Wenzel in the R&D team. The first new feature is the light shafts. There are volumetric shadows from clouds cast into the atmosphere. They are truly volumetric and 3D, fully integrated. They are not just a post effect as it is usually done in games. With this, the atmosphere from an overcast sky gets darker. And this is important for planets and locations with bad weather. Another component is the new ground fog. It follows the terrain up to a specified elevation for different locations. It is also fully integrated into the atmosphere. It receives volumetric shadows from clouds and terrain. It reduces the light scatter into the view ray. We are showing all the features combined together. In addition, we made many improvements to cloud shaping to allow for more variation and details. The shape noise blending, a vertical variation, has been improved a lot. Also, we made improvements to short and long distance read, and the tiling is less visible. And, and best of all, best of all, we are going to include all these new features and improvements in the next 3.22 release. Really happy to be here, really excited to show you. Uh, we're going to be showing Dynamic Fire in Star Engine. So Dynamic Fire is a driver uh, for gameplay in both FPS and multi-crew experiences. 
It creates emergent sandbox gameplay and it can be used by designers to craft very dangerous scenarios for players. And as you can see from the video, it gets very intense. Okay, so how do fires start in Star Engine? Well, there needs to be a source of ignition, and there are multiple ways in which it can occur. For example, weapon impacts or misfires, explosions or damaged items, and the player needs to be alert to their surroundings with fire and ever-present threat. If a fire does break out, you're gonna see it dynamically propagate through the area, uh, causing damage to environment and player, and at this point, the player needs to limit the damage, of course, by extinguishing the fire uh, in any way that they can. So when doing so, they're going to need to wear protective clothing to protect them from extreme heat. They're going to need to wear a closed helmet to protect them from smoke inhalation, poor oxygen levels. And there's actually multiple ways the fire can be extinguished, including the removal of heat, for example, using the fire extinguisher, which is my personal favorite. It's a lot of fun doing that. Or the removal of oxygen, for example, locking off the area, venting the oxygen, creating a vacuum. Or simply, the fire's burned so fiercely that it's, it's done everything it needed to do, it is nothing left for it to destroy. And if you let it get this bad, it's probably time to consider repairing your ship. Okay, so how do we achieve this from a technical perspective? Well, the first thing the artists and designers do is they mark up their scene to tell us what physical properties that each surface is made from, whether it's wood or metal. But not only on the surface, we have to de describe what is behind the surface. You might see a metal panel on your spaceship, but has it got cladding or wiring behind it? It's important we know all this so we know how flammable it is. Then after this, we have to define all the physical properties that go with these surfaces. So, for example, where the mass is, the energy density, combustion temperature, air fuel ratio. And we use all these physical properties and we sum them up in each voxel, which is a one by one meter cube. And then once we have these voxels, this forms the basis of our simulation. First thing we do is we look for sources of ignition and then we're off. So here's our debug mode that shows us what was going on in the simulation and is what we use to track it. And you can see these squares enlarging to show us where the fire is spreading. For each of these voxels, we're tracking the fire, the temperature, fuel remaining, the amount of smoke, and the fire is propagating via convection and radiation, which are both accurately simulated. And it's consuming the gases and producing the knock-on products as well as it goes. And because we're using a proper simulation, like Mike mentioned, when you vent a room, not only are you removing the oxygen and putting the fire out, but if the temperature remains the same, if oxygen is reintroduced, the fire will reignite and it will continue burning, just like it would in real life. What's next for this? So our focus has been on interiors, in particular spaceships, but all interior spaces really, and this voxel grid really helps us solve that problem. Our next focus is going to be on planets. Obviously, they represent a slightly different challenge, the vastness of them. We have to transfer this over the network and simulate it slightly differently, uh, and we also have to render it at scale. But the, the way we've done it, the, the, the core tech we've used, we should be able to scale this up quite easily. So that's, that's going to be our next focus. OK, so how do we create realistic dynamic fire visuals in Star Engine? Well, we start with the simulation, as just described by Ali, and this gives us the data we need to drive the visuals. Then we bring in the burn shader. So this can be applied to static environments. And we have a lightweight version of the shader for entities, which is kind of based on the, um, the dirt shader and wear. Then we've got the glow, which is an animated surface decal shader for static environments. This is where we get, start to bring in some nice motion. And then we bring in the GPU particles, which are spawning from voxels and in screen space. Obviously, these are doing a lot of the work visually. Then we bring in the lights. These are spawned for clusters of voxels as opposed to per voxel as an optimization, a cluster being a representation of voxels close to each other. And then we bring in the fog. So this is height laid volumetric fog. The smoke fills the room and it goes up to the ceiling before filling the rest. And we're simulating that. So to finish, we're going to take a look at all of that put together in the game.
So, water is a huge part of both of our games, Star Citizen Squadron 42, and we wanted to give it a major upgrade. We were going to set three ideas that we wanted to impart on our water. We want it to look as good as possible, obviously. We want it to look realistic. We want it to be beautiful. We want it to be in motion constantly. It should always be moving and always be reacting to everything around it, whether that be players or objects or vehicles. And we wanted this to work on the whole scales of all of Star Citizen, all the way down from footprints in puddles to enormous ships crashing into the ocean. I'm going to talk about our updates to the water rendering first. The water shaders, particularly the ocean and the river ones, were in dire need of a major upgrade. They were currently using a technique called deferred shading, which is really fast and fantastic for opaque objects, but does not translate well for transparent ones, which of course water is. So the first step that we made was to transition to forward shading. That allowed us to introduce more physically based techniques, such as proper lighting, reflection and refraction. It in allowed us to integrate the atmosphere properly into our water lighting setup. And it also meant that we could get more fun, more fun techniques, such as uh, wave crest backlight scattering as adding better foam rendering, which includes half tone blending, surf surface haze, and much more detailed bubbles on the individual bits of foam. I've got some examples of that here. In this particular screenshot, you can see the icebergs in the near frame. You can see we're refracting the iceberg underneath. It's correctly refracted. In the mid frame, you can see that the iceberg is reflected back onto the water. That is now accurate. We weren't doing that properly before. Here you can see our accurate water lighting from this really beautiful screenshot of the gladius over the water. I love this one. So this is the objects under the water have been correctly lit, which is new. And then we are applying the lighting changes from the, um, the specular highlights on the surface and also considering the lighting from the suspended particles in the water, depending on how deep and dense the water is, which gives us this really beautiful effect. Uh, this screenshot just looks good, but what is going on is that it's demonstrating that the atmosphere and the water are sorting properly. This looks like everything is normal, but it's challenging to implement with forward rendered water and uh, proper Raymarch clouds like we have in game. Props to Alan, who worked on all of this. I, d I did the, the next bit. Uh, and and here we can see the wave crash light scattering. See how the sun is coming across the back of those waves. It's lighting up the, su the suspended particles in them. It just looks gorgeous. Here we have the multi-layered foam. And from a distance, we have both surface foam and subsurface foam rendering correctly, looking really, really nice. I've just got a video here before and after. First of all, uh, this is our, our lakes on Standard 4. Uh, next, we have water volumes on Orison. There you go. <laughs> Uh, this last demo, this is a Clio on the Stanton system. This is what it currently looks like in game, and I think you'll agree, pretty dramatic difference. <laughs> so the next bit that I want to talk to you, that me and uh, the team of Planet Tech and Graphics have been working on, is of course water surface simulation. This has been an absolute pleasure to work on. So we had a few aims for this. We wanted it to be multi-input. We want physics to influence this. We want our MFX system to influence this. We want bullets, we want everything. We want high concurrency. You guys, it's a sandbox game. You're going to break it. You're going to stick a thousand, pi a thousand picos in our puddles. It's got to work. And it's got to be scalable. It's got to work from the tiny scales to the footprints in the puddles all the way up to, as I said, giant crashes, <laughs> giant ships crashing into the ocean. So the technique that we chose for this is a, a form of surface wave propagation. It's GPU based, highly realistic at a low cost, and it can be scaled for waves of different amplitudes. So we can have all of that built right in just by adjusting a few constants. I've got a demonstration here. We're going to have the player walking through the puddle. As you can see, as he steps, you get a bigger ripple. But even as he's stepping, the toe is being dragged through the water and moving the water accurately. This is not a cop out. We're doing this in 3D. You can see as I'm jumping. And then this next demo, we're going to fire some, some bullets. This is a bit loud, this one. Right, the one more thing that we had to look at. So it's all well and good, this working on a puddle, but Star Citizen is not made of puddles. It's made of oceanic planets. It's made of everything. We needed to make this multi-scale. So we, yeah, we wanted the water near and far, not just in a square around the camera. We wanted lots and lots at once. The solution we picked was a multi-region water sim. Now, this was really, really tricky to get right, but I really think we have now. This basically means that we can dynamically allocate all of the simulation regions depending on what is colliding where and what resolution we need at what parts of the screen. We can optimize this very heavily to make sure that you get what you want to see at the right time. We still need to get that information onto the water, though, and that's a bit trickier. So 
what we devised is yet another set of regions. Now, the regions are slightly different. The simulation regions need to happen wherever something is contacting the water, and that needs to happen regardless as to whether you can see it, because there's a collision going on there. I look away, and then I look back. If it stops going and has to restart, that looks bad. Whereas the water, we only need to know the total result when it's actually in view. So we have these new regions which cover all water in view. And the beauty of this is that we can use this for multi-input and multi-output systems. Anything can influence our water, whether it be the simulation, whether it be weather, whether it be VFX. And then anything can be affected by water now. So the water rendering reads from this. But then we can also spawn VFX particles from wave crests. We can add screen space effects. We can have a line across your visor. We don't have this yet. But it's accurate to the displaced water in front of you. We've got this technology now, so we can use it to influence any of our work going forward. And here's a really good video of some of it in action. Just I'll let that play. This is the debug mode. Essentially, we're moving a sphere of basically infinite mass through the water. And as you see, if we pan out a bit, we make our sphere a bit bigger, we get a much different result from the sim. Spawning the foam properly. It looks really nice. Really happy with this one. So what I'm going to do in a second is I'm going to turn on the, the debug mode so you can see where the regions are. You see we've got these gray boxes. They light up green when there is a hit inside the box. We've also got different sizes going on. If you look near the shore there, there's a big cluster of text. That is a whole bunch of other regions because there's some stuff floating there causing little ripples that we can't actually see. And as you see, these scale properly. We can add the results from multiple sizes of simulation together, and they influence and interact with one another accurately. You see those big waves crashing over the little sim there. It, yeah, it, it works pretty nicely. Yeah. <laughs> I've gone ahead of my subtitles, but I'll just let that video play out. What does that look like when we bring it all together? What's it going to look like in game? Now, you did see a little bit of this in the Star Engine trailer, but actually, I think this video does a little bit more justice to it. So I'm just going to let that play out for you. forward in a second, you're going to see the wake start to happen behind us there. And from the cockpit perspective, water droplets on the glass thrown up from the water sim. This is what I'm talking about using multi-output. And that's us. Thank you so much, Sitcon. Handing back over to Ali. Well, I'm going to talk to you about a few, a few smaller features and a few longer-term R&D features we're coming in on the visual side. This first one, something we wanted for cinematics and telling a story, but also to tie into our active feature system, which is to get the face to tell a little bit more story on our characters. This blood, sweat, and tear system is something we implemented recently, and it allows us to use a GPU particle simulation, which we project onto the face, and then we integrate it into the skin shader so we can get realistic reflection and refraction of water on your face. And we even uh, make the skin go a little bit redder to simulate the extra blood flow when you're tired or upset. <laughs> so none of this is a pre-canned animation. It's completely dynamic. We have complete control over everything. We can keyframe every single tear if we want to. And we can even simulate blood, like here. <laughs> so next thing I want to talk about is our scope shader. Uh, design came to me telling me that they really wanted to up, up the game with the uh, uh, rifle scopes. They weren't quite good enough, they didn't really feel realistic for them, and they thought it was a real core part of the uh, first-person shooter experience. So to give you an idea of what we used to do, we have these type of, they used to use these type of fake scope meshes, which you see here, which is where we type of slice the scope in half so you can see through it. And sometimes we put these big black planes around them to obscure your vision. And the, we put a bit of glass on the front of it, but there was nothing really to tell you that it was a lens. So we've worked on a new scope shader, which is now going to be on all of our scopes moving forwards. And I'll give you a quick show of what that looks like in game. So on the first scope here, we're going to see it's got an infinite projected red dot scope uh, sight. We've got lens distortions. You can see this little refraction and bending of light on it. You see, it works when you, you don't have to be actually holding the rifle for it to work. Yeah. We've got a correct emulation of eye relief on the scope. So we have the blur, distortions, uh, chromatic aberration. And then we've also got support for digital displays like this one, which has light amplification. 
and has a spot for EMP. So, you know, if you get an EMP, you're going to have the, the, the display is going to get distorted. So we're quite proud of this. We think it's going to have a much better, more realistic uh, simulation of the scopes in the game. And I think I kind of mentioned before, but it's, it's not a fake effect. It, it applies to our scopes no matter where they are. You don't have to be using the scope. You could look down somebody else's scope and see the same thing. It's fully integrated into it, so it's really quite proud of that. Next feature I want to talk about, hopefully, if any of you have a HDR monitor and you've been playing 320, hopefully you've given a go of the HDR feature. We're really proud of this. It looks really good. And we've got some great feedback from you guys as well. There's been some uh, strong feedback about we want extra black level control, so we're going to be adding that for you. So make sure you can tweak the image exactly how you want. Uh, and there's a great user guide on Spectrum as well if you want to know how to get the best out of it, because it's not always a straightforward uh, tech to get the best out of. Um, just to give you an insight of how this works, um, we've got something called the Unified Tone Mapping Curve. And this is the process where we map the real life colors of uh, real, real life in intensities of light onto what your monitor can display. And rather than having an SDR mode and HDR mode, we have like a smoothly uh, smooth system where we can blend between SDR and HDR depending on the peak brightness of your monitor. We also pay a lot of attention to make sure we preserve the colors and the hues to keep an accurate image for the artist, and especially for skin tones. We don't want them turning red or white or doing everything bizarre. Just one thing to mention, we've got some content adjustments that will be ongoing. We've got a lot of content in Star Citizen. It takes a little bit of time to make sure we balance everything so it doesn't look too dim or look like a supernova. Next thing I want to mention, temporal upscaling. This has been something that's been asked for for a long time. We're proud to finally get it into your hands. We've got three different techniques we're going to be implementing. Uh, we've got CIGs. Uh, we've got our own temple super resolution solution called TSR. We've got AMD's Fidelity FX Super Resolution 2. And we've got NVIDIA's DLSS 2 as well. Um, they each have different characteristics and hardware requirements and trade-offs. So it's is important to get you all free so you could have a choice of what you want to look. I'm left here. I've just got to zoom in from one of our outposts. That's uh, no anti-aliasing for people that really love to see jagged edges. Uh, the center one is our TSA, which is what you've got in the current release today. And on the right-hand side is TSR without doing upscaling. And this is going to be replacing the TSA solution. And this gives us better quality and more stable image and hopefully much less ghosting. We can use our TSR to do upscaling. Here's the example of how it looks at each resolution. And similar results from AMD's FSR. And some numbers here, which I'm sure you can pour over later. But basically, we can get about two times GPU performance if you're interested in using the upscaling technique. Uh, obviously, if you're CPU limited, you might not get quite them numbers. It depends on your machine. Uh, we also intend to look at frame generation techniques like FSR free and DLSS free. But these are going to come a bit later. We're going to focus on GPU performance, getting that up first. Frame generation isn't really applicable unless you've got a really good performance first. Some other quick updates. We've got the screen space shadows is added to Alpha 320. Uh, it gives us some extra detail in our shadows uh, across characters, and it's particularly on planets, it helps a lot. And we've also got a new texture and mesh uh, streaming engine that helps us get as much possible detail as we can onto your VRAM on your GPU. And it type of does something we call load balancing. It will scale dynamically for your GPU to make sure we can get the absolute best possible results. Uh, we've also got some more streaming uh, improvements coming in the next release. Just to give you a quick show of what the screen space shadows mean, here we've got a planet with no shadows. I think it's Microtech. Uh, the shadow maps, you see these the normal shadow maps that fill in half the scene. But then when we get the screen space shadows, you look in the, the top of the screen or in the, uh, the flowers, they type of fill in the detail for the rest. They really help type of bed the scene in and stop these things looking kind of floating. Next up, I just want to talk about planets for a little bit. Uh, it's something I get asked about a lot of what's happening next with planets. So we've got quite a lot of R&D in progress. First thing, we've got two new uh, pieces of tech being started recently. First is virtual terrain texturing. Uh, it's quite a technical detail, but what this means for you is we're hopefully going to get much less popping or no popping at all. And we're going to achieve this by moving all the calculations to the GPU. And we'll be reusing the same type of uh, patch-based system that Will talked about in his water presentation. And it should give you major CPU savings as well. So we're quite looking forward to getting this in. Another benefit is that it's going to give us the ability to add more complicated logic on so we can type of do more diverse and interesting terrain, like things like, you know, we don't have beaches at the moment, we'll be able to achieve that. And there's other similar things where, based on the local conditions, we're able to do more advanced decision making. Next thing we want to look at, which is probably the thing we asked about the most, is our scattering system, which is what's responsible for putting all the trees and the rocks down in the world. We're going to, again, move this to 100% to the GPU, and that should let us have vastly longer draw distances uh, right up until the horizon and much better performance. Uh, so we'll finally get rid of the dreaded pop of trees coming in. Um, we also have to integrate it with our harvestable system, the resource system, and the, the awesome fire system you just saw a minute ago. Another point is it's going to be a hierarchical-based system, which what that means 
means is we'll be able to use nearby vegetational rocks to influence what other vegetation rocks can grow or will show up. And this lets us produce much more complicated rule sets so we can do things like have a tree that maybe underneath it, it, it doesn't have any grass or maybe certain trees come together in clumps. And we'll get a much more natural distribution of vegetation. And final thing we want for planets is we want to be able to build them much easier, much faster, and we want to make sure they are truly unique. At the moment, our planets are unique. However, they are built from type of tile sets, like pre-built things that get mixed and matched together and blended in complicated ways so you don't see the repetition. But it's not truly unique, not in the same way that the Grand Canyon might be, or the River Nile or Mount Everest. And that's what we want. So to get that, we need to replicate the complicated natural processes on Earth, like geology, climate erosion. And these things aren't trivial. So we've got three options. We've got offline tools, Houdini, Terragen, things like this. We could simulate all these processes in the engine, but we've started some R&D a few months ago on uh, the whether we can use machine learning to do some of this. So just to give you a quick idea of how that would work or how it could work, if you just start with some random input here, it's just like some noise. Uh, we run it through a, a temporary, simulation, temporary simulation, so we can type of get a more reasonable uh, approximation of simulation at different altitudes uh, and latitudes on Earth. And then we, what we do is we categorize all this into different biomes, so based on the temperature and moisture, you'd find out what is a desert, what is a forest. This, this part is crucial. So this is the input for our machine learning algorithm. We could come up with this image any other way. You could hand paint it as an artist, or we could just randomize the noise to get a different set of images. And then what we do is we take the large data sets we already have from Earth, from Mars, and from the Moon, and we train it on exactly the same uh, distribution, uh, so biomes, so forests, uh, grasslands, and things like this. And by training it on exactly the type of data we get in reality, we can take this and then push just that and then we can get these lovely height maps out of it that tell us a really realistic distribution you can see here this is a height map so the black areas are low you can see all the little rivers and valleys and this had zero R input aside from this image very nice result um, it's early days. Uh, it, this is based on something called a custom diffusion neural network. Um, it's Like I said, it's pre-trained on Earth data, and it's been built up in patches so that it just doesn't become too expensive to build. And the little circular patches get like added together and they, to avoid all any seams in the image. Just to help you visualize it, I've just put some colorization on it to show you where like snow and beaches might be, and just wrapped it around a planet to give you a better sense so it doesn't look quite so abstract. Yeah, but this is very early days, this stuff, but we're hopeful this will be helping the future of how we build planets quickly and efficiently. So the last thing I wanted to talk about today is our Gen 12 renderer and Vulkan. This has been ongoing for quite some time, taking a lot longer than we would have liked, but we're finally getting to the end of this, this long journey. For those who don't know, the reason this was being implemented is largely for performance. We're going to be getting at least two times better performance on our CPU submission for rendering, which is often the bottleneck for the game, so that will directly, hopefully, translate to performance improvements. We also get better control of memory with advanced GPU features like resizable bar. And it also opens the door for some things like ray tracing and new mesh shaders. So we've got a video of a Vulcan running to live captured. So uh, I can't remember is this, which ship is this, but it's, um, yeah, it's all working fine now. There's a couple of hitches in performance, so we can't quite release it yet, but we're looking into them, uh, the last few performance issues and stability issues, and hopefully we'll be releasing it soon. So, like I said, the one thing, or one of the things we really were interested in by implementing Vulkan was to get support for new hardware features, and the, one of the big ones was ray tracing. So with that, I want to hand you over to Ben, who's going to talk about some of our lighting research. Use it, moving over to the Vulkan renderer, and now that that's fully online, we've got access to hardware ray tracing on the GPUs that have support for it. The best thing to do with hardware ray tracing would be to create a new updated global illumination system for us to use. Now, I'm here to give you a fairly early preview of the work that we've done so far. Uh, but first off, I'm just going to simplify some things and ask, what is global illumination? Well, you can break the lighting in a game down to three components. Uh, first off, you've got direct lighting. That's not global illumination, but that's uh, the sun, lights in the level, that kind of thing. Next up, you've got diffuse global illumination. Now, that's uh, like a whole hemisphere, like a soft lighting that affects the entire, that takes from the entire scene and lights up the pixel. And then finally, you've got glossy GI and reflections. Um, that's like your shiny surface glints, your mirror reflections, that kind of thing. And now all of those combine together to form one glorious penguin. Now, for the rest of this presentation, we're specifically talking about this guy, the diffuse penguin. Glossy GI has actually been disabled in all the videos. Even the old, st the old system videos don't show the glossy GI here, just to aid the comparison. Uh, first off, we've got a video from Chris Campbell, who's going to make us look cool.
So next up, the boring or the interesting bit. Um, how are we doing it? How does the tech work? Um, I'm just going to dig into that just a little bit. So we're closely based on AMD's recent paper, GI 1.0. We're probably going to build on top of that, but at the moment we're quite close to it. Uh, we ray trace against a simplified world so that we get um, like smoother lighting for the, since it's a diffuse scene, we want a sort of diffuse smooth signal. And um, this also means that we get more rays per millisecond, which is always good. And we do generate a lot of probes. So the new system is generating, well, for comparison, the old probe was about one probe per room. And the new system is about 25,000 probes that are all on screen at the same time. And we're going to see that now. So here's a scene that I've dramatized a little bit just to give trouble to the old lighting system. And this is what the ray tracing sees. So it's a simplified single color per object kind of thing. But then we've also got this uh, kind of a 3D dictionary of average light values so that the light is kind of shared over things in a similar area. So going back to the scene, uh, this is the old system. So you'd render a single image from the center of the room, blur it, and then slap it onto the entire scene. Now, as you can see, like the middle of the scene is about the right lighting, but everything else has got the middle of the scene's lighting. Like These red lights at the sides are uh, basically drowned out by the table bounce that somehow made it across the room to them. So we want to replace that system with 25,000 probes, each one of them only providing light to a small area around themselves. And then we interpolate that to provide like a smooth bounce. And you can see already in the distance, like the red light is, is really bouncing up there. And then we add a screen space occlusion pass just to, uh, just to tidy up the edges on things. And there is the final composite. So what else does it do? Well, because it's, re it's real-time generation, it means we can do a real-time bounce. And we can do that with quite small areas. You can get like a really vibrant bounce that picks up off small objects in the scene. And that means that the art team can really lean into like, strong local variation on color, as again, we will see. So we'll do a side-by-side -side comparison on this one. As you can already see, like, the spotlight's really like, throwing stuff into the scene. This is just one light in the room. And we could actually, we did have live updating, as you can see in the old system, but it's, it was designed for like, time of day changes rather than this continuous smooth view. And finally, it means that we can do things like glowing surfaces can just illuminate the world without having to add special lights to, to fake it. So yeah, there's two really common cases in star system particularly that this is going to help with. First off, cockpit brightness. At the moment, we capture that cockpit probe in a, in a setup scene, and then we don't update it as you're flying around. So you're not going to get the sky color in, and you're not going to get the ground color in. And then we've got the opposite problem that I don't have a picture for this, but cargo bays sometimes, they're light. You land somewhere dark, you open up the doors, and now you've just got this weird little light room with, uh, with nothing spilling out of it. So again, let's have a video. Oh yeah, so this is the old system. The sun's working, but you can see there's no sky, there's no ground lighting. By the way, I've turned off a lot of the cockpit lights so that you can see this. And then in the new one, you can already see the skylight is kind of helping a little. But then as you turn over, you get all the ground lighting. <laughs> see, one of the concerns we had was that we didn't want to create a two-tier system. If people have got hardware ray tracing and it's working for them, that's great. But you can't really have the art team optimizing was seen for one type of lighting and then having to optimize it for another type of lighting and having to trade off decisions about the two of them. So what we've been experimenting with is trying to create a new low bar that's higher than the old low bar as well as creating a new high bar. And the idea for this is basically to take that single room um, environment probe system that we have been using, update it so that we can do live relighting on that, and then to sort of slot that in where the ray tracing would be while still keeping all of the other stuff, like you know, the, the 25,000 probes and all that kind of stuff, can look at the old system and we kind of Frankenstein them together. So I'll show you what we've got so far for this. So this is just the old one and the new one so that you can see the problems. Like, just it's, it's overly lit, let's be honest. And now this is what Star System would have looked like if we released it on the PS1. Um, the sharp-eyed among you may have noticed also the ship is missing, but you know we can't do dynamic objects in this. You'll be surprised. It doesn't seem to mind. And there we have software GI in the middle, which is, yeah, like I say, it was using the same 25,000 probe system, but not having to use any kind of hardware ray tracing. As you can see, it's not a perfect match. It's not identical, but 
it's a lot more dynamic than the old system. And finally, I'm just going to show you a to-do list here. I don't have pictures because it's stuff we've not done. Glossy reflections. Obviously, we want to complete the picture. And for that, we need to handle glossy reflections. Is that self-explanatory, really? I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> Secondly, you've only seen it on, a, on opaque surfaces so far. The next step is to extend this so that it can support glass and water and all the other transparent things in the game. And beyond that, we've obviously got fog. We've got other atmospherics. We want to expand GI to make sure that it affects everything smoothly and equally. And the final thing is a star citizen thing. We've got giant scenes. We've got a ridiculous scale on some things. And we've got plans to make sure that this GI extends to handle that full scale. Anyway, that's all I've got to tell you now. I am Chris Rain, and I would like to show you not one, not two, but three new physics of our physics engine. And I would like to start off by introducing Star Cloth, our new character cloth simulation with a short video. So this is just regular player movement. That was actually me playing. You can see the cloth collides with the ground. You can see multiple layers of cloth that do not interpenetrate. Cloth gets influenced from wind and has accurate collisions with the player's body. We now have support for collisions from dynamic objects. You can play football in any outfit. Starcloth supports the full range of motion a human can make, from fast movement to extreme poses. Starcloth is designed to be a first-class member of our physics engine. It interacts with everything we have to offer, from character movement over forces like wind, thruster backwash, explosion to projectile impacts and collisions. It's efficient, it always updates at 120 FPS, regardless of the frame rate, and is hand-optimized. It's immersive and believable. It's a realistic simulation based on physical properties. It's high fidelity, high quality. We want to raise the bar with this. The visual geometry you see on the right is complex and not suitable for simulation. The visual geometry is made with visual quality in mind, and that does not translate well to simulation. So we decided to add the ability to use bespoke meshes that are made to simulate well and let their movement then deform the visual geometry. This allows us to share the same sim setup across multiple visual meshes, which is a huge productivity boost for for tech art. We can seamlessly blend the simulation on and off, so we can disable the simulation at a distance. Back to the football. Everything that is dynamically simulated is able to interact with the cloth, from ships over crates, boxes, and even footballs. We ensured that the collisions are accurate and believable. As you can see in the image, the football parts both layers of the gown. The cloth itself supports self-collisions, which means it will create folds and wrinkles, but not interpenetrate itself or other layers of cloth. The same applies to the static environment as well. The cloth will drape itself around the environment, so brushing up against objects will, re will result in the behavior you expect. We added tapered capsules to improve collision detection accuracy. A tapered capsule is a capsule which has two different radii at the endpoints. Human anatomy is complex, and we need to accurately represent it for collisions. The traditional capsules we use on our active lead to jumps in the collision surface. Now, notice how there is a jump between the elbow and the lower arm 
and another jump where the forearm connects to the hands. These jumps pose significant problems for our cloth simulation. If you look at the upper torso, you can see the collision proxies are actually completely hiding the cloth and they're essentially completely useless. So now notice the difference on the same body represented with tapered capsules. We can now faithfully represent the hips, legs, and arms of the character. An additional benefit of tapered capsules is that the collision detection is significantly faster than with regular capsules. Currently, we're only using them for uh, cloth collision detection, but in the end, we'd like to use them for everything. We simulate the cloth always at 120 FPS or 120 Hertz, regardless at which update rate the game is running at. We do this to be faithfully able to detect collisions with a fast-moving character. As we're simulating at a higher rate, than the game updates, we have to interpolate the joint positions between updates we get from the game. At each simulation step, we perform collision detection, simulation, and update the, sim, uh, the cloth sim cage. Now, if the game is running at 120 FPS, we do one update for the, for the cloth simulation. If the game updates at 60 FPS, like in the image, we simulate the cloth twice. Now, if the game runs slower, like at 30 FPS, we need to update the cloth four times. You can see this in the image. It's, it becomes apparent that we need to make the cloth run as fast as possible, and we spent a great deal of amount of time optimizing this with various techniques, including handwritten vectorization and using every trick in the optimization handbook. The effort pays off because we can faithfully capture very complex movement and fast-moving characters, even at low frame rates, without any clipping or tunneling. One area that poses a significant challenge for character cloth is when multiple pieces of garments layer on top of each other, like a tight-fitting jacket that lies on top of the pants, as you can see in the image above. This is a very difficult region to simulate properly, because you don't have much space and the simulation collisions have to be absolutely accurate. This, what I'm going to show you, is a very subtle effect, but once you notice it, you cannot stop noticing it. I want to focus your attention to the waist region of the character. Here we tweak the simulation settings in real time to see the effect. Here you see a, a rendering with a high fidelity cloth disabled. And here the same scene with it enabled. Next up, star hair. Currently, we have the ability to simulate the effect of moving hair with joints that are essentially simulated pendulums. The hair is skinned to these joints, and when the, these joints move due to the pendulum simulation, the hair moves with it. This leads to a fast and believable movement of hair. However, the quality is directly co correlated to the quality of the skinning which is tedious for tech art to achieve for some complex hairstyles. Further, apart from gravity, the pendulum joints do not react to external forces like collisions or wind or explosions. So we asked ourselves, can we somehow improve upon this? And I'd like to show you some early prototype results of our research. This is an image of the raw geometry you saw in the previous image. You can see many strands of hair, and we thought to ourselves, maybe we can simulate all of these strands. This is a single strand isolated from the rest. As these are simple triangle meshes, we initially thought we could simply use our cloth simulation and simulate such a strand like a sheet of cloth. That didn't work out at all. It turns out hair does not behave like clothing. Also, the sheer number of strands and their individual triangles and vertices are simply too much to simulate efficiently, even for our highly optimized cloth engine. We realized then that our artists are actually using splines to create these strands. And a spline is a smooth curve or line through space. You could see that in yellow. Um, and we thought maybe we can just simulate these. They're, they're much simpler. So 
And hair simulations need to be able to maintain the original hairstyle. You cannot have the hair simulation change the visual appearance of a character. One of the reasons why using the cloth simulation for hair did not work out as at all is that the cloth only simulates vertices and they have no concept of orientation. So you do not know how the next segment has bent in relation to your current segment. In other words, you cannot easily simulate twist with vertices alone. For splines, however, that is very easy to do. All of this together allows us to simulate the strands according to the theory of Cossarat rods. A Cossarat rod allows you to model the behavior of slender one-dimensional rods, exactly what our splines are, and simulate bend, twist, stretch, and shear, exactly what we need. Hair also needs exact collision detection to not intersect with the head, the ears, the cheeks, the jaw region. The video I'm about to show you is some very early prototype footage of how such a simulation actually looks like. So this is a test of various head movements to see how the hair reacts. Hair simulation is one of the hardest things to, special, uh, to simulate, especially in a real-time context, and very tricky to get right. We're actually simulating all the hair strands. So, we will have characters being able to run their hands through their hair and have the hair react realistically. A barber simulation next. Actually, being a bold man, this was a very touching moment for me when I made this video. Thank you, thank you. Next, I would like to introduce Maelstrom, our physically-based destruction system. And I would like to do that with a video that I believe speaks for itself. See the water splashes? We want players' intuitive prediction of the effect a weapon or a collision has to actually happen in the engine or in the game. So we decided to move away from hit point pools or other abstract models to simulate damage, but rather have damage be calculated from a physical model and from the physical material properties of each entity. If something breaks off due to its structural integrity decreasing bef below a certain threshold, Meltstrom allows it to break off in a realistic fashion. If you shoot off a wing, the missiles and weapons on that wing should still remain attached. If the broken off part still has power, electric items should still function. This means Maelstrom was needed to be designed to work with a hierarchical setup to begin with, from the hierarchical representation of the geometry we want to break off to the same hierarchy on a higher level item for items like power plants, lights, weapon systems, and so on. Maelstrom is persistence and networking ready. We designed it from the ground up to work with high latency situations to persist and replicate easily. 
To achieve all this, we gave each physical geometry instance an identifier to be able to uniquely identify it within the universe. So your gladius wing is your gladius wing. We added physical material and damage properties that can now be replicated across the, the network. One of them, and that's the most important one, we call integrity. And this determines how much structural or internal integrity a physical geometry has. Integrity is modified from dissipating or rather absorbing energy from kinetic impacts or energy weapons, and also in the future from absorbing energy from external factors like extreme temperature or fire, as you've seen before. We also track which physical part or geometry the, uh, belongs to which visual geometry and which high-level entity. So if the structural or inter internal integrity collapses, we know which visual geometry is affected and which item might be affected as well. So a power plant will cease to emit power or implode, explode. A weapon will cease to fire and so on. To make things break apart, we create what we call breakable clusters. A breakable cluster is a set of physical geometry, the visual geometry, and the entities on top that can break off. Between breakable clusters, we create abstract cantilever beams. To be able to model stress and strain, I'll go into more detail in that in a bit. Breakable clusters are hierarchical. They mirror the hierarchy of all attached entities involved. They also embed the hierarchy of all animated joints, and they also embed the hierarchy of all physical geometries. They essentially represent a ground truth of the entire hierarchy necessary to perform all our goals for Maelstrom. This image is showing a breakable cluster graph of the Gladius. I'd like to show one more video of Maelstrom before we continue. We needed to find a good way to easily and efficiently determine when a breakable cluster breaks. We chose a well-established model from material sciences and structural engineering, cantilever beams. In essence, a cantilever, be a cantilever is a structural member that has a fixed support and a free end. Forces experienced on the free end can be used to calculate the amount of stress the fixed support is enduring. The basic be ideas behind that are best explained from a very simple example. If a ship were to collide with the horizontal part part of the crane in the image, far from the vertical part, the fixed support would endure a higher stress as if the ship were to collide closer to the vertical part. But not only does the point of impact determine how much stress the cantilever beam experiences, also how large the surface area is but, uh, connecting the cantilever and the fixed support has a large influence on when a cantilever beam will break. In our case, this actually means we analyzed the cross-section of the intersection of the set of geometry from two breakable clusters to calculate the surface area. A wing attached to the body has a rather large connecting surface area compared to the surface area calculated for the stabilizers connected to the body. We then project forces from impacts and explosions onto these cantilever beams and calculate the stress the beams experience. Over time, this stress turns into strain, and if we reach a certain threshold, the beam snaps. The result, simple, efficient, and deterministic breakability. But this is not just about ships and buildings that you saw in the videos before. We want Maelstrom to be a systemic system that we can use on all types of entities. So here is some video of some test footage of AI shooting each other behind breakable cover and Maelstrom barrels.
physical and material properties influence damage and breaking and have a direct influence to how things break and fracture. To achieve this, we added various properties, density, yield strength, resilience, thickness, toughness, Young's modulus. And this is more or less what I wanted to talk about Maelstrom, but I don't want to leave without showing one more video of what carnage Maelstrom can, co can create. So. so the next thing that's left to build a ludicrous space game is audio. And so I'll leave you with Graham, who's going to show you some of the new audio enhancements we bring to Star Engine to make it even more realistic than it is now. Hi, CitizenCon. Graham here. Good to see you. Recently in the audio team, we've been looking at how we can create a greater psychological connection and emotional impact within our games through the use of improved audio technology. Audio can play a crucial role in the immersion of the player. And with that in mind, the audio code and technical sound design teams have been looking at all of our tech from the ground up. For example, when you're under threat, you should feel a real sense of danger. When you're armed, you should feel the dangerous power that you hold within your hands. Earlier this year, we showed you our resonance tech, which allows us to bring the action much closer to the player, even when they're deep in the bowels of a ship and far away from where all the hits and the explosions are happening. But that's just one part of a much larger push to create a better, more immersive audio experience. With that in mind, let's take a look at some of the tech we've been working on. First, let's listen to some of our weapon sounds in action. They're a great simulation, but we wanted to take them further and express the sound pressure, the forces being exerted. Our new in-house audio effects, particularly the multiband compressor, tuned by our sound designers, give us this result. The compression serves to illustrate the power of the weapons and the effect that they have when going beyond the limits of the listener. Let's show you the same audio effects applied to the ship weapons, taking us from this to this. But it's not just about feeling powerful. Changes in audio can create a sense of danger, of being out on your own and under threat. Here's an example of ship combat. Sounds good, but what if we wanted a little more realism? The audio propagation tech that we've been rolling out makes it easier to change the soundscape in real time, and a nice use of that technology is to provide a more realistic option. Here, your own weapons resonate through the hull of the ship. Only what's in the pressurised cockpit is heard clearly, and the threat level feels higher due to the isolating lack of enemy weapon and ship audio. Making these changes creates space in the audio, both spectrally and temporally, making impacts seem bigger, more damaging, more of a problem for the player. This realistic mode isn't limited to the flight experience, it's applied appropriately to the game as a whole. Here's an FPS battle in a depressurized area.
With realistic mode, we get that sense of isolation again, giving the location a different colour and adding variety to the audio experience. Player breathing and foley are exaggerated and other sounds are transmitted through physical contact. That's all from us for now, we look forward to getting these new audio features into your hands. Persistent Entity Streaming, Replication Layer and Beyond. I'm going to show you a little bit insight in our technology for Persistent Entity Streaming and the Replication Layer. I thought about what's the best way to show you something about that tech, and I thought about putting some technical drawings on the, on the slides or maybe show video like we did two years ago. But really, the best way to show you how Persistent Entity Streaming works is to give you a live demonstration. And that's what I'm going to do. All right. So this will all be live. So please bear with me if there's any glitches. So on this left side, you will see my client window. And on the bottom side, uh, you will see the server renderer. So for this demonstration, on this side, you see the client. On this side, you see the server renderer, which is currently, uh, it has nothing streamed in. I'm showing a small uh, demonstration level. And on this side, you see the entity graph which is our online database um, that's powering what you see in persistent entity streaming, what you play since 3.18. And I also have some metrics on the screen um, which shows the entity graph uh, worker, the requests per minute, uh, per seconds, the mutations, and you also will see uh, entities created and destroyed once I do that. Wait for my client to come up and uh, join this level. So the first thing that will happen when I join this level, you will see on that server everything streams in and my client get connected and also streams in everything on the client view. Um, what would happen on, this, on the behind the scenes is that my player just got unstowed into that chart and we had real time created everything for this player. So you will see his body is attached to the player. You will see his Moby glass, his head with all his customizations, um, his undersuit, and then all his uh, customizations as well on the undersuit. What you also see is that this player just got unstowed and attached to a uh, static zone object container. And this is how our zone system works. Basically, on the server, you will see three different zones, purple, green, and red. And they each zone comes with its own coordinate system and its own physical grid. And this is how we actually, on live, do uh, zone transitions between your ship, empty space, space station, um, or a planet. And you will see, as I walk between those zones, I will at real time update it in that entity graph. And this all happens seamless. So for a client, this is completely transparent. You don't notice that. But this is actually what's happening when you step in or out into a ship. And this is very unique to our engine. Um, no other engine has this zone system. And this allows us to do all the amazing stuff you saw in the videos before, transitioning in and out of uh, planets and go from the smallest scope to the largest scope. Um, so everything we do in a shot, so this is like a mini level, like the mini PU level, is also persisted in this database. Um, when we create new entities in our engine, in Star Engine, those entities get pushed into our entity graph, into our online database at real time, and then from there replicated to our clients. So if I go ahead and spawn a couple of plushies here, you will see they spawn, uh, they get created immediately on my entity graph and replicated on the server and on the client. Um, so let's spawn a couple more here. And you see this, the uh, pangos I spawn in the other zone get attached to the other zone. Um, and then if I go and transition one of those, they will also transition between the different zones. Um, and the same works for ships or more complex entities. If I spawn 
uh, this buggy here, you will see this one gets created with all its attachments and, its, uh, and everything else attached to it. And this is just my small demo level here. On live, we have up to 600,000 dynamic entities that get created for one single shard. And this is just the initial state after two weeks, three weeks of gameplay when you guys go in and destroy stuff, spawn stuff, play around. It's, it goes in the millions of entities. Um, so this in itself is pretty, pretty amazing tech. Um, the next time I want to talk about is our streaming system. Most engines stream on uh, texture or geometry. We actually stream entities, and we do stream persistent entities. So when I turn on the, the streaming system here, and I walk into this, uh, if, if I walk over to the red area, you will see that the purple area will stream out together with all the entities on that server. So it does not only stream out on my client, it actually streams out on that server. And when I come back in the green zone, that purple zone streams back in with all the entities in there with their full persistent state. Um, so now I have uh, a second player joined. Benoit is going to join me. So Ben, if you want to join, OK, I think you see him over there. Hey, Ben. Sorry. Nice. All right, I'm going to spawn a couple more penguins here. Um, because the next thing I want to talk about is new technology we are right now developing and we are about to put on the tech preview for you to play. Um, and this is actually the replication layer split. And that's the big next step in our, in our great vision, obviously, as you might know. So in this demo, my client and my servers, they are no longer directly connected. Actually, I have a, a new service running here, and that is our replication service. So my client is connected to this replication service, and my server is connected to this replication service. And the replication service, its own perp the sole purpose is to get all the entities which are in the entity graph and stream them to clients and servers which are connected to. And, and what's really cool about this is uh, let's do a little experiment here. Um, I mean, you all know our game has bugged. Uh, it's, it's still alpha, and sometimes things can happen. So let's see what's happening uh, when I kill my server here. So this is my server, uh, the actual console. So let's just shut it down. And yes, this is where you would usually see a 30K or something. Uh, you can see Benoit kind of froze there for a bit. Um, and the buggy does a bit weird stuff. I can shoot those pingos, but the world is really in a frozen state right now. But I didn't disconnect, because I'm connected to the replication layer and not to the server anymore. Uh, in the meantime, I'm just starting a new server. Let's be a bit patient for it. Come back online in a second. And as you can see, now that the server came back, it restored the state. It, it restored the state, and the simulation just continues to work as, as before. Um, so this will be, again, this is a very early tech, but this is, this is a, a great benefit of what we have with our replication layer split. But there's one more thing. Um, and let's try this thing again. I just killed my server, and I, I'm trying to do that again. But this time, um, we're doing something different. So let's first go in here. Um, this is my development tool. Uh, I can talk about it in a second. So let's stop that server again and restart. This tool you see here, this is our internal development tool. Um, this tool runs the entire stack of our game on this PC. Um, this is obviously for development only, and I can do that with my small test level. This really helps online devs and all people who work on the incredible, complicated tech we hear to be able to develop our game. Because I run everything on this PC, it's a bit slow. So, all right. Simulation continues. I can see Ben moving again. Hey, Ben. However, what just happened? Well, as you can see on my screen, I no longer have one server connected. I have three servers connected to this replication layer. So what you guys see here, this is the very first version of a working server mesh. So now I'm going to explain a little bit how this magic works, because it is truly magic. Each server, when it came up and the replication layer realized there are three servers, we assigned different zones to those servers. And we said, OK, server one, 
you are the authority over the purple area. Server two, you are the authority over the green area. And the last server is authoritative over the red area. Um, you can still see that those servers have all those entities replicated, but only the, the entities within their zone are actually authoritative on that server. So while I'm in this green zone at the moment, my entity is simulated on that green server and just replicated on the other server. And now, as I transition between those zones, you will see that on that green server, I just lost authority. And on that purple server, I just gained authority. Um, and because it my entity was, my player was replicated on both servers, this completely uh, works seamless. Um, and again, let's do that a couple of times. You see on my client here, I don't notice anything of that. This, is, this all happens behind the scene. And this uh, doesn't work only on me. Let's turn on the, uh, the zone colors and the object, the uh, authority assignment on the client as well. You can see that even entities, as they transition into the other zone, seamlessly transition to that zone. And not only that, I can also interact with entities that are on the other side. So if I go on the green zone, for example, and I shoot this, I can still shoot that purple uh, entity. And I can also just go ahead and destroy that buggy which sits on that other zone. There you go. Always fun to blow stuff up, right? All right, um, so there's more to this. Um, the first thing I will do, let's spawn a fresh buggy. I just destroyed my old one. Um, when I go into this buggy, I will become part of the aggregate. And that means that now my buggy and myself will transition authority together. And this is how we make sure that my player, while he's driving this buggy, is always authoritative on the same server. So you can see. As I drive around with this bug between the zones, I will switch between the different servers. There's more to this. So remember when I turned on the streaming earlier? The same streaming mechanics work here as well. Like obviously in this example right now, you can see all those servers, they have all those entities replicated. And it's a little bit wasteful because you have three servers, all need to replicate all those entities. And that's where streaming come into play. I can turn on streaming here and you will see that suddenly my purple server no longer has the red area streamed in, and the red server no longer has the purple area streamed in. Um, so let's see what's happened when I drive my, my buggy uh, backwards into that, the red zone. What happens on that purple server? And I just disappear. So right now, on this server, there's only Benoit replicated. And Benoit, if you come, come to me over in the red area, you will see that now on this server, there's no client at all. And in theory, we could now completely stream out the entire area on that server or stream in a new area. And you will also see as I drive back into the green area, I will magically reappear on that purple server. And this obviously works on, uh, on, on the other side as well. Uh, let's get a couple more player join. I have a, a couple more QA in the back so you can just see the whole thing. Uh, running at life, uh, running in life with, with a bit more uh, things going on. Let me get out of this buggy. And you will see on each server renderer which clients are currently replicated on those servers and which clients are actually authoritative on those servers. And you can see this, the green server, because it's the middle one, has most entities replicated. And then you can see this purple one at the moment only has one, one client replicated. Yeah. So yes, this is pretty much it. It has been a long time to come to this point. And I, can't, I just can't put in words how much tech and work we had to put into this. Big shout outs to the network team. Big shout outs to the online services team. Big shout outs to Chris to let us doing this. It's been 
a really long journey to get to this point. Uh, and I've got to say, the team has done an amazing job. They've been working diligently for the last four, five years. We've had a couple of false starts. We finally have an incredible, I mean, the way the replication layer works and how we can spin up servers and down and keep the state constant, even if a server goes down, is, I think, a genius design. And the first time I saw this, <laughs> about three weeks ago, working fully, I cried. <laughs> it's like giving birth. We did it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we wouldn't have been able to do this and work on this kind of tech without all your support. That's right. Uh, you guys and your trust. allowing us to take the time to do it right, to really build it. So thank you. Thank you guys. So much for everyone. And thank you everyone at CIG that's really worked hard to deliver all this amazing stuff that will be either in your hands now or in your hands very soon. And this is just the beginning of CitizenCon. We've got a lot more stuff to show you. Yes. That's what we need for this right. MMO, guys. That's what we need. Great demo, <laughs> by the way.